Calculation of wind loads on transmission towers is a complex problem. Our tower program provides you with several methods for calculating the wind loads acting on tower members. These loads can be entered manually, for example if you've done external calculations, or they can be determined automatically by our software. Automatic calculations can either be based on the approximations provided by different design codes or standards, or they could be based on the theoretical principles of fluid dynamics. This video will explain how the different wind model types are applied in design, and we will use a simple example model that ships with our software to try and illustrate how the software uses these different models. This example has been set up with several load cases showing how different wind loads can be applied to a tower. And then to assist you in verifying the results that we produce, I will also explain some of the background calculations and show you how to access the extended diagnostic information, which can be useful for you to verify the intermediate calculations made by tower. Wind loading on members is based on the following simplified relationship. Wind pressure multiplied by drag factor multiplied by the area. This force is then projected in the direction of the wind speed and yields a horizontal factor design wind force on the member. Half of that total wind force is eventually transferred to the joints at each end of the member. This is because tower only applies loads at the joints or nodes and not along the members. This simplified loading expression can be expanded to the following general expression. Here the reference wind pressure in the transverse and longitudinal direction is corrected for height and terrain category. The gust response factor and drag coefficients are often determined by design code. And the wind area is taken as either the projected frontal face area or for member based loading is determined using the projected wind pressure normal to the member. These parameters are largely controlled by information entered in the loading file, either a LCA or LIC file, as well as some of the data from the sections table. The reference wind pressure and the wind area adjustment factor are manual inputs, unless you're generating loads from PLS CAD, in that case they will be determined automatically, and the remaining terms are based on the wind or ice model selected. There are many window ice models available inside tower, but these can basically be grouped into the following four categories. The first three of which are generic tower implementations. These are wind on face, wind on all, saps wind, and then the code winds, which could be either face based or member based. Looking first at wind on face, here we can see that only members that belong to the face of a section are subjected to wind loads. There is no adjustment for height or terrain, so the input pressure is applied to the full height of the tower. Both height adjustment and structure gust response factors are equal to 1. Drag coefficients should be manually entered into the sections table in the drag times area factor for face column. And the area used in the calculations is simply that projected area of the member on a plane perpendicular to the wind, but only for members that are in the face. The second wind model is wind on all. Here, all of the members belonging to a section are subjected to wind load, and it's assumed that there's no shielding of any members. We don't really recommend this wind model since there are better generic or code specific methods that are available. Otherwise though, the manner the program handles this wind method is very similar to how wind on face is treated. The third wind model that we've implemented is the SAPS wind. This is by far the most practical and accurate wind model that we have. The wind pressure increases with height above ground and the wind force accounts for the incidence angle between the member and the wind. In fact, we highly recommend this model for certain types of tower, basically where you do not have nice square sections. When applying the SAPS wind model, just note that all members that belong to a section are subjected to wind load, and it is assumed that there is no shielding of any members. This is a conservative approach. 
The height adjustment factor is calculated exactly based on the elevation of the midpoint of the member and also two parameters you select for the wind velocity escalation law. The structural gust response factor is calculated as per the standard that you're using and your drag coefficient is entered manually in the sections table in, under the SAPS columns, either for angle or round members. The last two terms there are indicating that we use the full wind width times member length and we account for the relative orientation of the wind and member. To see which members are included in the transverse and longitudinal faces, you can change the display by going to the view, display options, set rotation, color and label options menu. Or you can use the 3D set button on the toolbar. Here we can choose to color by face. Tower automatically assigns members to the respective faces. This is usually suitable and appropriate. However, there may be unique structures where you wish to have more control over which members are included in the respective faces. To allow this, you can override the faces manually. There are a few ways you can do this. The easiest is to context click on a member and click on the override face and choose which value you wish to override it to. Alternatively, you can do this in the geometry members override face or geometry members fence override face menu. But you can also do this through the geometry members capacity and overrides table. Remember that if you override the face designation, members that are in the face will now contribute to wind loading. We can also color the model by section. Now sections allow for us to assign loading or other parameters to all of the members considered to be part of that section. During tower drafting or detailing, towers are typically broken up into sections with each panel shown in detail on one drawing sheet. Panels or sections should typically be limited to about 30 to 50 feet. Members are assigned to various sections in one of three ways. Firstly, by either specifying that all members between two designated joints belong to that section or by specifying a section for each individual member in the angle member connectivity table or lastly by graphically selecting members using the geometry sections fence assign members to command. In the sections table we typically assign how the drag and area factors are applied for each section of the tower. As I've already mentioned, we have separate inputs for face, all, saps, either angle or round, and for the code-based wind methods. Now you don't actually need to enter all of these values, but we strongly recommend that you do so in case future projects will require you to use other wind models. For the wind on face, and wind on all inputs, we need to enter values for both the transverse and longitudinal faces, as they can be very different depending on your tower geometry. Also note that we need to know what the area factor is. Now please note that this is not the wind area factor that we mentioned earlier. This area factor allows us to account for members that are not modeled in the tower. But these members do actually add wind area to the real tower that you wish to account for. These could be redundant members, gusset plates, sign plates, etc. On this model, for all of our sections and faces, let's assume an area factor of 1.2. The drag factor that we suggest entering for wind on all is typically in the range from 1.2 to 1.6, specifically because we are looking at angle iron members. We suggest using a value on the lower end of this range since there's no shielding and all members see wind load. For wind on face, we would typically use a larger value. This is normally double the value of the members on one face, and here we would suggest using a value of 3.2. For the SAPS values, we recommend using a value of 1.6 for angles and 1 for rounds. Note that for code implementations, the drag factor is not entered. 
as it's being determined automatically for the specific code of practice that you are using. So all that needs to be entered here is the area factor. The very last column in this table allows for gross area overrides. These allow you to override the wind area of a section to use the gross section area as if it was a solid area. This is useful for congested parts of the tower like the bridge or arm of flat configuration single circuit towers. The overrides here that you can apply are for the transverse face, longitudinal face or both. And there are two other special overrides that can be applied. The first of these are to consider the section as a cross arm. Doing this will trigger a special cross arm loading for all EN5341 derived load cases. And the second of these special overrides is the IEC square override. This will trigger the use of one of the IEC equations for yawed wind on lattice tower bodies. Again, this will be applied to IEC 6826 and EN 5341 derived load cases. Before we run this model, let's look one more time at the load cases. As we saw earlier, all of the load cases use effectively the same wind speed. This has only been compensated for the averaging period required for various codes. You should make sure that you know what wind speed is required by your loading code. We've got some help in this regard. If you press the Edit Loading Method Parameters button, this opens a dialog that documents how Tower applies the various wind or ice models. For some of them, you can enter specific parameters to adjust the program defaults. This will better match site or location conditions for your project. There is a tab for each of the loading codes that we support, and the very last tab is the SAPS Wind. Here you can vary the wind power and reference height if you wish to do so. For all of these available codes, you can generate graphs that will display how the variables behave according to the code that has been selected. Let's now run our model. Once we've done this, I always find it helpful to isolate specific load cases in the deformed geometry view and to display the load vectors and foundation forces. As you press the F6 key, it will cycle through the display of each load case. You will note very different results depending on the method used. However, the results are all in the right ballpark and are quite similar to each other, considering the various methods that are used. Another quick way of seeing how similar these load cases are to each other is to go to the summary results report and look at the overturning moment summary for all load cases table. You will here see a similar overturning moment for each window ice model used. Let's now scrutinize some of the detailed calculations. In the analysis results report, jump to the section load case information for the wind on face wind model. This shows the results of the wind pressure, drag coefficient, and transverse wind load that results on the sections. If we look at the similar table for different code-based wind models, you will see significantly more information gets printed. Here we'll see the calculated drag coefficient, and for some of the codes, we will see the solidity ratio and some other parameters that are necessary for the calculations. However, we still don't know some other background information. For example, what is the structure gust response factor and the height adjustment factor that has been used by PLS Tower? To display these calculated results, we make use of one of the output options in Tower. This is to print extended diagnostics. If you select this option and rerun your analysis, you will see the following data is printed out. Let's look first at face-based wind models you'll see a whole additional table gets printed. This is the extended angle wind load diagnostics table. This helps you figure out projected areas and lengths for each section or group in each section in the model. For SAPS wind and other code-based winds, you will also now see the gust response factor 
and structure height adjustment factor printed out at the end of the tables we saw previously. So this should give you all the tools necessary now to corroborate Tower's results if you need to do so and to understand what has been calculated for your structures. In closing off this video, there are a few final topics that I'd like to mention. The first of these is how Tower handles wind loading on guy wires. Now, wind loads on guy wires are normally neglected during transmission tower design. So, if you wish to incorporate the effect of the wind loading on the guy wires, you'll need to use one of the member based loading approaches, such as SAPs or one of the other code based derivatives. This will then use the length of the guy wire that's been modeled and it will use the drag factor from the cable component library. The second topic to mention are yawed winds or oblique winds. These winds can easily be handled in tower, but it will require you as the user to enter the transverse and longitudinal component of the wind pressure vectors. Unless you're generating the loads from PLS CAD, in which case these components will be calculated for you. Some codes have an additional amplification factor, which will be included by Tower if you use the correct code-based wind or ice method. The final topic to mention is that Tower also allows you to add wind areas or drag areas to any joint of a tower for things that are not modeled but can in fact bring loading onto the tower. You could use this to simulate signage, ladders, cable trays, or anything of that nature. These are applied to any joint of the tower by using the geometry, dead loads, and drag areas dialog. You will see that nothing visual is added to the model. If you wanted something visual to be added to the model, for example, a piece of equipment, we have another menu option to allow that. It is a very similar approach in the way that the loads are calculated, but in this case it will leave a visual representation on the screen. For more information about our software, including additional videos and technical notes, please visit our website at www.powerlinesystems.com. For inquiries regarding our software, price quotations, technical support, or any other information, please send us an email using the addresses on the screen. Thank you for watching our video and for your interest in the software, the industry standard in overhead line design.